Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm glad you guys spoke up. <laughs> um, hopefully you can hear me now. Okay, so sorry about that. Okay, so let me start over again. Um, so um, I wanted to say, uh, first I'd like to remind everyone to take quiz one, which is available on Moodle, which is the dropbox.csc.sc.edu. Uh, that is the, uh, we, we don't, we give the quizzes on Moodle. Uh, not on Blackboard. If this was a face-to-face -face course, I'd give you 20 minutes to take the quiz. So I'll try to wrap up today about 20 minutes early to give you some time to check out the quiz. And it's kind of an encouragement for you not to wait to the last minute. Uh, the quiz is due on Wednesday, this Wednesday at 6 p.m. Um, so um, be, don't don't forget about it. Uh, it looks like 11 of you or so have attempted the quiz, and I haven't received any notes about any bugs or or hiccups. So it looks like we're in good shape. And uh, hopefully, also you received an email earlier today about Lab One, which is or Project One, Programming Assignment One, that was uh, assigned today. It's posted also on Moodle, uh, Dropbox.csc.sc.edu, and I'll talk about that. Uh, I'll talk about that briefly uh, today, um, and then after that, I'll continue the lecture on interface protocols, uh, starting with a recap of, of what I talked about last time. Uh, so if anyone has any questions about anything, just feel free to post them in the chat. And again, sorry about the, uh, the audio issue. OK. Um, and we are recording, right? Yes, OK. OK, so in case you're not aware, I think most of you are uh, aware of this stuff by now. but um, uh, so wait, let me back up here a second. So first of all, the, the, we want your lab programs, the program, the, the code that you write for the lab, we want it to be able to, we want it to work on the Linux, uh, machines, the departmental Linux machines. Um, so you, you can develop the code on your own personal machine and test it, but, but as a last step, you should make sure that it, that it runs successfully on the, on the departmental Linux machines. Uh, and so to connect to those, you need to establish, if you're off campus, you have to establish a VPN connection first. And I have a, a link there in the slide uh, for instructions that I, I believe work for, for the students. Um, and then there's also uh, another link there, which the second link uh, is a list of all the machines, the addresses of all the machines. Um, and if you click that link, it'll ask you to log in um, before it'll show you the, the list of uh, uh, Linux machines and their addresses. So you can basically just uh, connect with the VPN and then pick one of the machines. Usually, I think I think most people have kind of a favorite machine. They they get, they're kind of their go-to machine. Um, so you pick one of the machines. I think there's about 40 of them. You pick one of them and then you connect and then uh, you, you'll you can connect with you know an SSH client and then you should be able to uh, to to test out your code. Uh, if if you have any trouble with that though, let me know. If, if you need any help or you're um, having trouble getting on, let us know. Okay, so the uh, so as I mentioned, we have the lab, uh, the lab sheet, the lab description, and we have some templates that are available to download on Moodle. The lab sheet is uh, is uh, describes all the details you'll need to know for the lab, but I'm going to just kind of just go over it very broadly, just just so you have a general idea. Uh, of what's going on before you start reading the lab sheet. So the objective of the lab is to, well, first, it, it's intended to be a hello world type project. It's supposed to be uh, fairly easy, so it shouldn't take you much time. And it, the purpose is to ensure that you, know, you, you can remotely access the departmental lab machines, as I mentioned, and also give you kind of a preview of the type of projects that we'll be assigning in this class. Um, the objective is to read and to write a program that reads and interprets a signal trace file. Uh, what is a signal trace file? It is a um, it is essentially a way to store a timing diagram in a file. So that you know, if you think at the think back at the last couple of lectures, we looked at a lot of timing diagrams, uh, which is um, a representation of how signals change over time. And a, and a signal trace is just a way to store that information in a file. Um, the, the traces that we're using in this lab uh, are a list of captured samples that are measured at um, different times, which the times that they're sampled at are, 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 can be non-uniform. So basically, what, what it's, what's happening is that it's taking a timing diagram and it's storing it in, in, in a tabular format as a table, basically. Now, specifically in, in this lab, there are nine signals that are stored in there. There's a clock signal and there's eight data bits. 
uh, that are meant to be read in parallel. And you're meant to read the data, pit, the data bits um, on the rising edge of the clock uh, in this case. And then the values that you read from those, you just basically just print them out. Um, now we've got things automated to where um, you will actually know whether your project is working, at least with the test cases that we provide to you, uh, by just running a script. Um, so you type sh gray.sh uh, in the root directory of the project, and, and Charles will correct me if I get any of these details wrong. I think you, you run that in the root directory, um, and it'll, it'll tell you uh, if, if your code is working. It'll give you feedback. So, uh, so the, the if you look at the first test case, I took the first test case that we include, and I I drew it up as a waveform. So I took the data out of the trace, and I just by hand converted it into a waveform. You know, just just drawing it, and so you can see that there's a clock signal, uh, and then there's there's eight data signals labeled uh, S0 through S7. So those are labeled on the vertical axis and then the horizontal axis is time. And so the granularity, at least of the, at least of the one in, in the, the signal trace that I'm using here, the granularity was milliseconds. So, um, so that the, every, every, every time you saw a time, uh, sample time, it was in milliseconds or one thousandth of a second. Um, but, You'll notice that not it's not necessarily sampled at every millisecond. So it, the first sample is at one millisecond, then it skips two, and then you see three, four, and five, and then it skips six and seven, and so on. So I've I've highlighted in red, uh, and I placed a a vertical line uh, representing all of the uh, uh, time all the samples that are stored in that trace file. So, for example, at um, at one millisecond, the clock is so. You, so, in order to to kind of interpret this, you look at the vertical line coming up from one millisecond, which is the first sample, and you just look at where that line intersects on each of the signals. So, you can see if you if you bring it up to the top, over here on the clock, you can see that at one millisecond the clock was zero. S and then S zero was zero. S one was zero. S two was zero. S three was zero. In fact, they're all zero in the first sample. And then the next time you have a sample is at uh, three milliseconds, and at which point the clock is still low, uh, but S, um, S0 was, is high now, S1 is high, uh, and the rest of the signals are still zero. Now, in, um, in, 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 in principle, you might have changes, multiple changes between the sample times. So for example, the clock could have been low, and then it could have went high and back low again before the next sample happened. However, that's the way that these these traces are typically stored is that um, each sample is recorded after any signal changes. So in other words, when you have a gap between samples, like between one and three milliseconds, the reason that gap is there and why there's nothing at two milliseconds, for example, is because nothing changed in, in between one and two nanoseconds, or one and two milliseconds, rather. Um, so basically, anytime any one of these signals changes, is what's going to cause the signal trace to basically store a uh, a sample that will capture the signals after that change, right? So that's the reason why um, the samples are not necessarily every millisecond or even uniformly spaced out. It's because you basically get a sample whenever any signal changes. Now the the so you might say, wait a second, then what, what's you know what's the objective of the lab then? Well, these are um, the, the signals are, are changing. They're not necessarily all changing at the same time, but when, we, we, when your code is supposed to read the values of, of these of data bits um, after the, on the rising edge of the clock, so basically the idea is, is that your code needs to look for the rising edges of the clock, okay? And then it's going to capture uh, what the, the state of those signals are after each rising edge. So that's, that's kind of the idea. Um, uh, of of the, um, uh, of the of the lab, right? Okay, so so the the trace file itself. Th there's different ways to store these signal traces, and as as Charles mentioned, there um, one format is called a value change dump VCD. It's kind of a standard uh, a standard format for for signal traces. Uh, however, the one that we're using in this lab is a proprietary format that we made up. 
um, but it's a lot simpler than the VCD. Uh, so if you look again in the lab description, describes this in detail. This is just an example. So this is actually um, the this this trace file that I'm showing is the is is corresponds to the timing diagram that I showed you uh, on the previous slide. This is the one that I translated. Um, so you can see that the file uh, starts out, the first line of the file has the number of samples, in, in which case we have 12 samples. The second line has the list of signals. So we've got clock and then S0, S1, up to S7. Uh, the third line has the number of bits per signal. So there's one bit for each one of these signals. Okay. Then when you get to the fourth line, things change a bit because the fourth line, uh, the, the first three, the, sorry, the first, I should say, line two and line three both have nine columns because, you know, there's one column per signal and there's nine signals in total. There's the clock plus the eight data bits. But then you get to row number four and all of a sudden now you have ten columns. And the reason for that is because the first column is the time and then the the next eight columns represent the values of each of the uh, nine signals, right? So, and that's, you know, hopefully that's kind of straightforward. It's a little confusing when you look at it, though, because as you can see, the way it's tabulated out uh, when I, when I uh, copied and pasted it is it looks like um, the, the, the columns two and three don't, don't line up with, with the columns below, right? Um, so that, that could be a little, a little confusing when you look at it. But, but just keep in mind that the, uh, the columns two and three are, there's just one column per um, signal, and then the rest of them have an additional column at the beginning, which, which notes the time, all right? Okay, so, um, so we are going to provide you, oh, sorry, let me, I forgot I had this stuff all note, uh, animated out. So, so yeah, again, the first value there is the number of samples. Um, the first, the first uh, row there has the signals, right? The, the, the third, the next row after that, the third row has the signal widths. And then the next row has um, the first sample. And then, you know, subsequent rows have the other samples. And in each one of these samples is comprised of a uh, sample capture time followed by uh, the corresponding signal values, right? So again, it basically, um, anytime any one of these signals changes, it, you, you get a you get a row inside inside here. So the idea is is that um, this is kind of a, a compressed format, really, in a way, because uh, samples are not shown uh, when no signal changes. It's only when a signal changes uh, that you have a have a signal here uh, or have a line here, sample rather here. All right. So um, uh, so 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 anyway. Um, yeah, Charles says that the file could be tab. You could go in and insert a tab there if you wanted on lines two and three to make the files more readable. But it turns out that you don't even have to do that because we are providing you uh, some support software. We're providing you a library that will actually parse uh, these these files for you. So you don't have to worry about writing software to directly read the contents of these files. So you might say, well, then why the heck did you show it to us? Well, it's to, for debugging. Right, so when you're writing your code, um, you know you, you can look in those files to to you know as part of your debugging if if necessary to see if you're you're getting what you should be getting here. Um, so for example, just to give you an example of this, right? Um, if I look at this trace file and I'm looking for the first rising edge of clock, so I'll, I'm going to look at the uh, you know obviously the clock is the first column after the time here, so I'm going to look for the first rising edge. That's the, uh, when I see zero become one, um, and then you know that would be the the clock edge that I'm looking for, and then I I could the the, the corresponding value on the data signals is what you're supposed to be printing out, um, and everything else you're ignoring. So that's kind of an idea of how you would use this to to debug. Uh, but we are providing you um, a library to to read to parse this this file, uh, and we're we're giving you libraries in both C and Python, so you can choose which one you use, or you can use uh, another language. We, we, we don't even care what language you use. Um, however, we're only providing the, uh, the library, the support software in, uh, for C and Python. So if you use another language, you'll have to write your own, uh, or you can also write your own you know, parsing code, uh, even in C and Python. Uh, so uh, the code is, is self-explanatory. Um, 
it's it's commented it's it's easy to read um, but um, and it's also described in the, uh, the the readme too for the lab so this is this is uh, this this information is uh, pretty accessible uh, but just to give you kind of a general idea um, the first thing you do in your code is you're going to want to instance the data structure uh, that stores this this data that that's read from the file and so in C uh, there's a type called waves and in Python um, there's a class called Waves, um, and C it's not capital. Waves isn't capitalized in Python. It is capitalized. Um, and then in C, uh, there is a function um, uh, called parse file that will that will read the file. Now, in the, in the case of the the way the grading script is set up, you actually don't even read the data directly from the file. You read the data from standard in because the, the files are are actually piped into your program. Uh, so the, this is actually the exact code that you would write in C would be, um, oh, actually, no, that's not right. Uh, you would call parse file, you would pass it in standard in, uh, and then it would return um, a, a my waves pointer. So you would have to assign that to my waves. So uh, I thought I had, I thought that's how I had it. Let me fix that right now. <laughs> so uh, my waves is what I called this thing, and then I meant to put equals like that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, Charles is right. When I, 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 he's right. Originally when I wrote this, I had, I actually had waves star my waves. So I declared my waves and then assigned it. That's actually, Charles, you're right. That is what I had originally. Uh, and then I decided that that was, you know, declaring that, that variable and, and setting it at the same time was, was, uh, I it was a little too dense. Um, so I split it out, uh, and so I declared it up here, and then I assigned it down here, and I just forgot to update the line. So sorry, I, this is the um, this is the way it should say. It should be declare it here, assign it here, um, and then after you get done with it, there's a corresponding free that you can do to to deallocate that data structure. Um, it's called free wave. There's a free waves which deallocates the memory, and then in Python, uh, there's a method inside of the my wa the waves class called load text, and in this case, to get the the data from standard in, you would just pass in sys standard in read. Okay, and then um, to locate the time in which a rising or falling edge occurs uh, for any arbitrary signal, uh, although in this lab we're going to be looking for rising uh, edges of clock uh, in particular, uh, but there's a, um, in C we provide a function called next edge that'll return a floating point value of time. Uh, so you pass in, in next edge, you pass in the, the waves object and then the signal, a string containing the signal that you're looking for. And then um, you can give it um, a starting point. So this allows you to kind of walk through time and look for each rising edge. Um, and then there's flags for whether you're looking for the positive um, or the negative edge or both, um, which is, you know, so if you set these both to true, then it would you know, you would look for the next rising or falling edge after uh, the time specified and after. Um, and then the, the, the function returns the time. And then likewise, Python uh, has a similar function called next edge. Uh, it's used in a similar way, except it returns a tuple, uh, which gives you the time and also a flag indicating whether it found it or not. Um, I think in the case of C, if it doesn't find it, it'll return infinity, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you're looking for... Uh, infinity is kind of like the error air condition there, whereas in Python, you're just looking at the, the tuple, the second part of the tuple, which is a flag, tells you whether it found it. Okay, um, so uh, so the read a signal value at a specific time, you just use the signal at, returns the value. Um, it returns a 32-bit integer, although in this case, you know, keep in mind that when you re read a signal, you're only reading a single bit, so the other 31 bits are not, not used. Um, Python also has a signal at um, C, you know, has an underscore, whereas Python is a, uses a capital A. Um, and then uh, we provide a logging function in C. Uh, it's actually not a function; it's actually a macro. Um, and then Python, I don't know why we don't have a log for that, but you can just, you know, just do. Uh, you can just print messages directly to standard error. Uh, the log macro in C is pretty much just a print to standard error as well, except it, it adds a little nice little prefix there that gives the um, that that puts in I think the time you know the the, lo the the time in the file where where the log was called, um, so so that's I think those are the only functions you're going to need for this. Now obviously there's other functions in there. There's internal functions, um, but um, um, 
uh, but these are the main ones for this lab. Uh, so as you might imagine, you know, we'll have, we're planning to have labs uh, moving forward that will have you uh, using these, these, th this type of interface and this type of trace file to read more complex, uh, to read and interpret more complex protocols. Uh, in this case, we're not necessarily even caring about a protocol here at all, other than looking, f you know, clock looking in for um, the values of signals when the rising edge of the clock occurs. Okay, somebody had a question about preferred language. Um, um, we we don't we don't really have any preference um, at all which language you use. Uh, we're we're totally flexible about it. Um, it's totally up to you. I'm kind of curious, you know, in, in a way, I, I kind of look at this as kind of a survey to see, uh, you know, what, 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 what you guys prefer in terms of languages. I think uh, my understanding is that none of you have ever actually learned C at USC. Uh, you, you learn C++ and CSE 240, and you learn Python and CSE 274 robotics, but you, you never actually had a class in C. So um, we think probably, we expect that most of you will use Python, but, um, you know, we'll be interested to find out. Okay, uh, so if there's no other questions about that, I'm going to switch over to another lecture, set of slides. Oh, that's a, uh, will it matter if we use Python 2 or 3? Um, yeah, Charles says you need to use Python 3. I don't know what what is specific to Python 3 in there, but um, uh, Charles wrote the Python uh, code, so, oh yes, yeah, so, so the script uh, sets up, yeah, the, the, the grading script uses Python 3 when it when it executes your code, uh, or it sets up a virtual environment that, that uses Python 3. All righty, um, okay, I need to switch over, share, So stop sharing that and start sharing that. Okay. Okay, so last time I filled up the material on UART. And um, uh, so UART is a low speed protocol and it, it requires that the both ends of the connection um, agree on a uh, an amount of time in which each bit occupies the channel, uh, the reciprocal of which is the baud rate. Um, and uh, there's some optional, aside from that, there are some other things that the, the both sides of the channel must agree on, um, including the number of uh, stop bits and uh, whether or not there's parity and if the parity is even or odd. Um, and so the, the channel physically is made up of a ground wire, and then there's one wire for uh, transmitting and one wire for receiving. And then you actually, uh, one side of the channel will connect its transmit to the receive on the other side of the channel and vice versa. So you have to, you have to cross the two wires over uh, when, you, uh, when you connect two hosts or two, two endpoints, two devices, two entities on, on a UART channel. Um, so it allows, uh, if you have both of these wires, then you have bidirectional communication between two endpoints. Uh, the, 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 uh, the channel is normally uh, high when it's idle, um, meaning it's a one, a logic one, um, and until you get a start bit, which is a logic zero, and then um, the bits are sent serially from least significant to most significant, and then that's followed by a, an optional parity bit, and then a stop bit, a stop bit is, uh, when the channel is set back high for a bit period. Um, the parity bit is a little confusing because the parity bit is about counting the number of one bits that are sent, but um, in UART, the number of one bits are counted across the data portion and the parity portion together. So if you have odd parity, um, you're using the parity bit to ensure that there's an odd number of one bits set uh, across both the data section and the parity section, right? The, the data bits and the parity bits. So altogether, there should be an odd number of bits. And likewise, even parity, uh, there should be an even number of uh, one bits. Um, 
So we looked at some examples here. So here's a kind of an annotated one. This one has seven data bits, so you don't necessarily have always, uh, you know, eight, one byte. Um, there's always one start bit, I believe. So, but in this case, we have two stop bits. So this is, you know, this is how this this particular channel was set up. And there's no parity bits. And so, in order to read a timing diagram, um, you you basically have to identify the slot, the time slot in which each bit is transmitted. So in this case, it's pretty easy. We got these dotted lines that, that show, that divide up the time slots for each bit. And so you can see that uh, we're transmitting 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 1, right? So that should be 7 bits, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, yeah. And then keep in mind that because we're, we're transmitting least significant to most significant, you have to, um, when you reassemble these 7 bits into a word, a 7-bit word, um, you basically have to kind of reverse it um, according to the way that you're reading it on the timing diagram. So um, even though this one bit was sent last, it actually uh, ends up being the leftmost bit in the value that was sent after it's converted from serial back to parallel. And so in this case, there were seven bits. So in hex, it's four zero because it's one followed by uh, six zeros. Um, and then you know the stop bits again. The stop bits both have to be high uh, if there's two if there's two stop bits. Okay, so here was another example with nine bits. Um, this one had a parity bit, and in this example, I also had a a bit where we knew had a had a we, we didn't see one of the bits. It was hidden, and but we can we can infer what was in there using the parity. So in this case, uh, we have even parity. So there should be an even number of of um, of one bits. Now the trick though is is that when you count those you have to make sure you don't include the start or the stop bit uh, but you include all the other bits. So uh, so I'm counting one bit so I start with the second from the left. Uh, so that's one, two, three, four, five. So there's five uh, one bits so far um, and then there's the one that's hidden. And so because there's even parity, I know that that one that's hidden must be a one because I, that would, that's the only way I would have an even number of one bit. So that would increase the number from five to six. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's, uh, so that's it. Is there any questions about that? Is that, is that pretty clear? Everyone okay with that? Okay. Good. Um, all right. So um, then we talked about SPI. SPI is a um, designed to be uh, a, a higher performance protocol than than UART. UART is intended for terminals. SPI is for sending data, uh, things like sensor readings and uh, commands that you're sending to, to peripherals. Like you can think of SPI as something that you would use to send, uh, you know, instructions to you know, a robotic arm or uh, to a motor, servo motor, or stuff like that. Um, uh, SPI is synchronous because it includes a clock along with the bundle of wires that make up the channel. Um, there are, so, the, so that means that you don't have to agree on a, uh, a bit uh, time uh, or a baud rate, uh, but um, uh, there are some other settings that you have to set up that have to be consistent between the, both sides of the channel. Um, there's also this idea of of there being a role in in the uh, in, in an SPI channel. So um, there is a master and there are one or more slaves. I think I don't think I got to the multi-slave uh, version um, as of the last lecture. I think all the examples we looked at so far was one master and one slave. Uh, so the master in initiates transactions and the slave has to follow through, meaning that it has to uh, follow through the the transaction that the master starts. There's no way for a slave to initiate um, a communication. Um, SPI is byte oriented, so it it operates in terms of eight bit bytes. Um, and the bit ordering though is application defined, so it could be unlike UART, which is always least significant bit first. Uh, SPI can be either one. That's something that both uh, both sides have to to agree on. Um, now, the I mentioned that the the SPI is is meant to be like a kind of a shift register where every time you perform uh, 
a, a, a communication on SPI, um, it's meant to be an exchange where both sides uh, get data, whether they want to or not, basically. Um, uh, so, you know, basically in this case, you have one master, one slave, you do a, you do an exchange in which the eight bits of the master are sent to the slave and the eight bits of the slave are sent to the master. Um, the channel itself is comprised of four signals. Uh, there's a clock, as I mentioned, then there's MOSI, MISO, and SS. So most the master out, slave in, and the MISO is the master in, slave out, and the SS is the slave select. The slave select is really the, the signal that, that initiates a, an exchange uh, because the clock is actually idle um, uh, and, and the clock only runs, the clock only oscillates uh, when the slave select is asserted. Now to, to, to add a little bit more confusion here, the slave select is active low, uh, meaning that the the slave select is normally high, logic one, and then when you're doing a transaction, the slave select is logic zero. Uh, and that's kind of like UART, right? Because UART is normally logic one when it's idle as well. Um, and then the the important thing to understand about these signals, though, is that the master controls three of these guys, and the slave only controls one. So the master control, and when I say control, what I mean by that is only the master can send a value on the clock, MOSI, and SS. Uh, the slave, and only the slave, likewise, can can put a value onto MISO. Um, so, so you know that that's fixed. Now, that's not going to be the case when we get to the next protocol, but that's how SPI um, SPI works. Now, if you have multiple slaves, it gets a little bit more complicated. But I'll talk about that um, uh, in a, in a couple minutes here. Okay. So I I also mentioned last time that there's this idea of clock polarity in in clock phase. So I mentioned that the slave select is logic one whenever the channel is idle and is dropped to logic zero uh, when there's a activity on the channel. Um, the clock, though, is different. The clock can spend its time uh, when, it's, when, the, when, there's, when the channel is idle, the clock can be either zero or one, depending on the polarity, this, the clock polarity. So if the clock polarity is zero, the clock uh, spends its idle time at, at logic zero. And when its, uh, when its polarity is one, the clock spends its idle time at uh, logic one. Um, why would that be the case? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have, n I don't have any idea what the history is behind that decision. Um, probably because when SPI started, there was some, uh, disagreements as to what that clock should be. And so this is kind of a way to, uh, um, to, 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 to for, this might be a compatibility, uh, rationale behind this, but basically clock polarity defines, uh, the default state of the clock when it's not running, when it's not oscillating. And then CIFA is the clock phase, and that defines the, uh, the time at which the data changes uh, relative to the first change of the clock. Now this one is, you know, this one is kind of confusing, but the way you can think of it is if the CIFA is zero, it means the data actually changes before the clock does by one half clock cycle. And so the, the result of that is if CIFA is zero, that means that you can sample the data on the very first edge of the clock, which, um, you know, is nice. But, you know, you start the transaction and the first time the clock changes, boom, you get the first bit. Um, but if CIFA is one, um, then you have to wait till the second edge of the clock. And when I say second edge, I mean just second edge, either rising or falling. So... Um, so basically, that's that's the um, uh, that's the idea behind those two guys. Uh, and again, I think yeah, I think Charles is right. I mean, this is this was this was designed for compatibility reasons between different vendors, uh, which apparently uh, means that you know that they, the company started using SPI before it was kind of officially standardized. Um, so this is kind of a um, you know kind of a retroactive uh, patch. Think of it. Okay, so here's an example. Um, so we've got uh, slave select goes down here. Uh, that means that we're doing an exchange. Um, the S, as I mentioned, the clock only runs during the exchange. And I'm giving you the C pull and the CIFA. But once again, you don't need to actually know. You can tell what C pull and CIFA is from the timing diagram. You don't need me to tell you that. 
Um, you know that because you just look at what clock is at the beginning. In this case, it's zero, so C pull is zero. And then for the C file, you just look at when uh, the first edge the data changes on. So you can see that most C and MISO both change um, before the clock does. See, the, so the one half cycle before the clock goes from zero to one, you already got the two, the two data bits uh, changing. Uh, so that means that CIFA is zero. If CIFA were one, then you wouldn't see the data change until the first rising edge of the clock. So, uh, so if you look at these four timing diagrams, you can see all four uh, combinations. Now, is in terms of the bit ordering, the bit ordering is something that you would have to be told. There's no way to know what the bit ordering is from the timing diagram. Uh, so that's important to know. So even though I show the 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 C pull and CIFA it's kind of redundant, but the bid ordering is important. Um, okay, so what's the value being sent? Okay, so in this case, um, one way to do this, the way I do it, is I just kind of draw, I just kind of draw vertical lines here um, on each change of the data, and then um, so that kind of divides the uh, exchange up into slots, and then you read the the corresponding bit in each slot, and then you you reverse the bits if if needed. If if the bits are sent in least significant bit first, then you would read each bit from left to right, and then reverse them. In this case, it's most significant bit first, so it's just you just read the bits in the right order uh, from you know left to right, most significant to least significant. And as I mentioned, there's always eight. These are always multiples of eight. So zero one zero zero is b, and zero one zero one is five. And of course, we've got data flowing in both directions here. Okay, so um, so so there's the idea of an exchange and the idea of a transaction. So an exchange is basically every eight bits that that a, a an SPI channel is active, you're exchanging data. Now this also gets a little bit more confusing when you have multiple slaves. But right now I'm just referring to one master, one slave. Every eight cycles that the slave select is low, you're doing an exchange. A transaction. Uh, usually involves more than one exchange because a transaction is usually um, is 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 when you use SPI to do a programmed I/O transaction. So program I/O I mentioned in the fir the first lecture is when you want to do a read or a write operation, and a read or a write requires that you send a an address along with the data. And so um, if you have a bit serial protocol like SPI then you're going to have to send the address and the data you know across the same you know the, the one bit line that you have right so the address the, the bit the wire is being used for to, to convey both the address and the data now if you're doing a, a load operation you're going to send the address in one direction and the data back in the opposite direction because a load is where you send the slave an address that you want to uh, load data from, and then the slave would send back the data at that address, and that would require two exchanges, two eight-bit um, exchanges. This is assuming, of course, that I can fit everything, you know, the address and all the associated flags into into just eight bits. If if not, then I have to uh, complicate things even more and do, um, uh, and possibly do multiple exchanges just to send the address the address across. Um, now, in in the last semester, last spring, when we taught this course, we never had any peripherals that required that. So we've always just assumed that you know one exchange is enough to get the um, the address over the over the channel, and then subsequent exchanges will be data. Uh, and then, likewise, if you're doing a write operation, then um, the communication would just be one way. So you'd send the address across and the data across, and then you know the 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 master wouldn't necessarily get any data back from the slave. Uh, but even this, though, is is really an application uh, specific protocol, right? So SPI doesn't dictate how loads and stores, uh, or or how transactions are performed in general. So this is something that you would get from the data sheet. So the only thing the SPI protocol provides is the ability to do an exchange. When it comes to transactions, that is going to depend on each specific peripheral. Okay, so we're just kind of giving you an idea of how the peripherals worked that that we've actually used in this class, uh, but that's not necessarily how all peripherals are going to work. Okay, so uh, just just to this is just shows that again. So the master, in, you know, you, you have two bytes. 
to do a single load or store. If you're doing a, a, um, a, a load or a master reading from a, a value from the slave, you would send the address and then you'd get back the, the contents of the address in bytes one and two or exchanges one and two. Uh, and then likewise, if you're doing a write, master's writing or storing, the master would just send the address followed by the data. So here's, um, this is actually taken from a data sheet from a peripheral, an accelerometer that we used. And you can see that uh, the first exchange uh, had some flags in the address and the second exchange was the data. So we, you know, this is a load. And I, I went over this last time, so I'm going pretty fast. Um, uh, and then the right, of course, um, just requires, doesn't even require the, the line coming back from the, uh, the slave to the master, which is the MISO, which is showing the MOSI. And I also mentioned last time that these, the, the names of these wires can also be a little different depending on the data sheet you're looking at. But it's usually pretty obvious, you know, that, you know, that the select is the one that's always high and then just goes low for a, an exchange. The clock is the one that just oscillates with a regular period. And then, you know, of course, you've got two data lines. Okay, um, so here's an example. Uh, I think this is about where I got last time. So you you look at this. Hold on a second. Yeah, so you look at these um, these two exchanges uh, are comprising 16 bit periods, bit times. And so you 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 decode this by by uh, interpreting what bits are being sent in each direction. And then typically you would know whether this is a, a read or a write or a load or a store, uh, depending on one of the bits in the first byte that's sent from the master. So in this case, let's see, it's um, least significant five bits is in the address and the read write flag is stored in the most significant bit of the first byte. So that would be the first bit of the first byte transmitted is the flag, in which case it's it's one. You see there's one master to slave. And so one represents a write because of the way this is shown. So write would be a zero, uh, sorry, read would be a zero and write would be a one because there's a little negation above the uh, R. Uh, so this is a write, which makes sense because you don't see any data coming back on MISO. Uh, so yeah, there's the flag, There's these are don't care bits followed by the five bit address. And then in the next exchange, you have the data. And the, 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 the data traveling in the opposite direction is a don't care. Okay, so, um, okay, multiple reads. So what if I wanna do, I wanna do, uh, I wanna write two bytes. Um, you can actually, in, depending on the peripheral, if it's supported, you can, uh, you can do a multiple read or multiple write. So again, this came from a, uh, a peripheral data sheet. And in this, this peripheral, there was a, in addition to the read or write flag, there was a multiple or single flag, which when that bit was set to one, and this was basically just bit number six, the second bit from the left. Um, and, and by the way, when I say that, I'm assuming that that these are most significant to least significant, the, the ordering that they're being transmitted. So. Uh, so the first bit in this case would be most significant, and um, that's the read or write flag. And the next bit, bit bit six, would be the um, multiple or single flag. And so if that's one, then that indicates that that address is just the starting address of what will be um, a, a multiple byte read. So for example, if the address that I send is five then I could get the first byte that comes back is going to be the contents of address five and then the contents of address six and then the contents of address seven and so on for as long as I hold the, the chip select down. Um, so that's a multiple read and likewise a multiple write would um, work in a similar way, except in that case, um, it's just you're writing to, whoops, you're writing to multiple um, addresses there with a multiple write. Uh, so here's an example of that. Um, so again, this is a, you know, some of these are kind of misaligned a bit. Sorry about that. Try to line these, line these guys up on the clock edge. So in this case, I'm lining up each of these dotted lines on the rising edge of the clock because of the polarity being zero and the, the, um, the phase being one. So the, uh, the first exchange uh, is the master sending the byte 
um, 01001110. And so this is a a a write and it because the read write is flag is zero and it is a multiple write because that flag is one. And so the address is um, is is 14 1110. Uh, in this case we've got one, two, three, four, five, what six bits for the address. So the address is the starting address rather is 14 and then I write in this case two bytes. Why just two? Um, because that's how long I held the master held the slave select low. So you know if we give you a problem like this on like a, an exam or a quiz, we'll explain to you you know how what the protocol is for doing um, uh, the multiple transactions and you know loads and stores in general. Um, okay, does that make sense? Everyone comfortable with that? Okay, um, so next topic is the shared um, the shared connections, multiple slaves. What if we want a so we can only have one master in an SPI channel, but you can have multiple slaves. Uh, now you might say, why would you want that? Uh, well, typically low cost chips are limited in the number of SPI interfaces they have. So if you buy the um, the the Atmel AT or sorry the AT Mega the Atmel AT Mega 328P which is the chip that we use the kind of the quintessential Arduino chip uh, the one that we used last spring it only had uh, I think just one SPI channel but there's other chips that have you know three four SPI channels um, so uh, so you're limited, right? So in other words, if you only have one SPI interface on your chip, then if you can only have one slave, that means you can only talk to one peripheral. Um, so what if you want to talk to more than one peripheral on SPI? You have to use multiple slaves. So there are two options for this. SPI offers two options for how to connect multiple slaves. The first option is where you the master uh, has its MOSI and S clock are fanned out to all the slaves, connected to all the slaves, so they all share a common bit, common signal. Uh, but then it has one slave select allocated for each slave that allows it to talk, it allows it to address an individual slave. Okay, so that seems straightforward, right? I mean, it makes sense. Except there's one problem with this. That means that all the slaves are sharing a MISO connection back to the master. And this is a problem because this has to be dealt with somehow. How do they share this wire? And I'll talk more. I'll talk about that in more detail uh, in a minute. Option two is you can daisy chain, and this is kind of cool. This kind of um, uh, refers back to the the idea that SPI is supposed to be a shift register where you're shifting bits. Uh, so the idea is that um, the um, the the S clock and I'm sorry that is a typo. The S clock and the SS um, are connected from the master to all the slaves, um, and then the MISO coming out of the master is connected to only one of the slaves, and then that slaves, um, sorry, the MOSI. Yes, the MOSI of, from the master um, is connected to one slave, and then the MISO from that slave is connected to the MOSI of the next slave. And then the MISO of that slave is connected to the MOSI of the next slave. So here's a picture of these two options. So option one is um, basically the MOSI and the S clock are fanned out. You know, they're just kind of the master. Those connect to all the slaves. And then you have individual slave selects for each uh, individual slave uh, that that allows the master to talk to one slave at a time. The daisy chain approach is where uh, the S clock again is connected to all the slaves, but the uh, there's only one SS that's also connected to all the slaves. But the MOSI coming out of the master goes into the uh, MOSI of the first slave, and then its MISO feeds into the MOSI of the next slave, and then its MISO feeds into the MOSI of the next slave, and then finally the MISO of the last slave connects back to the MISO of the master. So basically you just create a ring, essentially. Um, now in this case, in order, basically what this means is that when you do an exchange, 
you're exchanging, um, you're, you're basically doing an exchange where um, if you want to send data from uh, the first slave back to the master, you have to actually shift by 24 bits. You have to shift uh, data through all, all four uh, hosts. Whereas if, you, if the master just wants the data from the last slave, it would only have to shift by eight bits, right? So uh, the problem with the daisy chain approach is it may take uh, more than eight bits to, to fully execute the exchange. So it's, it's, it would have to be coordinated depend on, depending on where, you're try, where the master is trying to get data from on the slave and which slave the master wants it gets its data to. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more detail here about option one. Um, so option one is, as I mentioned again, uh, you've got uh, these individual slave select connections that go out to the individual slaves, but each of the slaves have a MISO that are basically shorted to one another. Right, so they're all just connected to they're they're just they're all just connected to one common net, right? And so they're having to share. All the slaves have one shared port connected back to the master. The problem is is that um, SPI uses what's known as a push pull style uh, interface for each of its bits, and so the way it works is that you you essentially have an inverter in each of the chips that drives uh, the output. So when, when you have a, um, a, a, a chip that wants to drive um, an output pin uh, to logic one, it pulls that pin up to VDD through a transistor. Um, and then, um, you know, that, that's how it, it pulls it up, right? To, to, or, uh, it might pull it down to ground, in which case it would turn off the pull up transistor and turn on uh, the ground, the pull down transistor. So essentially, the what's happening is that the uh, the chips are shorting a pin, an output pin, to either a VDD the power supply or shorting them to the ground in order to set the output to either um, you know one one volt or zero or five volts, right? If it's a five volt system. Right. The problem is, is that if you have two of these guys that are both driving one common wire, and if you try to pull up on one and pull down on another, in, in other words, you have two devices that are both driving one wire, and they sort of disagree on what that wire should be. One of them is trying to set it to one, and the other one's trying to set it to zero. You end up with a low impedance path between the power and ground, because you have a low impedance path uh, from that from that wire to the power supply in one chip and a low impedance path to ground in another chip. So you you basically you create this short circuit, right? So for example, if we assume for a moment that um, the the transistors when they're turned on uh, they have an impedance of one one ohm, um, that would end up that would give you a two ohm uh, path between um, you know the the power supply and ground. Uh, and if you've got five volt supply, that, that means you're going to be drawing two and a half amps uh, just using um, uh, um, Ohm's law uh, between the the power supply. So you'd be sourcing, you know. Now I'm assuming, of course, that the there, there's no impedance along this wire, right? Um, that that are, that they're sharing. But basically, you're you're getting like you know, say two and a half amps, right? Um, which which might be enough to to fry this system. But also, even more important than that, is that the voltage on that that wire will be in the forbidden zone. It'll be, you know, in the middle, like two and a half. Uh, if you have a five volt system, you'll have like a two and a half volt uh, effective voltage of that line. Which means that anyone that's reading that as an input is going to be confused because they're not going to know if that's a. There's no way to tell if that's a zero or a one value, right? So you can't have that. So what you end up having to do in the case of this uh, option one for multiple slaves is you have to have the ability to have the chip electrically disconnect itself from, a, from an output wire that's shared using this like tri-state uh, device or pass transistor. Um, so that way each chip has to know whether or not it should be driving or disconnecting itself um, from, from its shared input output wire. And as it turns out, the, the chips that we used last semester do support this. They have fairly robust um, I.O. buffers um, on, these, on these pins. 
especially because the pins can be, you know, they can be inputs or outputs and they, they, there's different modes you can run their pins in. Um, but that's not necessarily always the case. So you have to be aware of that. And of course, you always run the risk uh, in this scenario of, you know, accidentally turning on two endpoints at one time. If, for example, you're doing, like if you're implementing SPI in software and you have a bug in your software and you have two slaves try to send data at one time, you, you can have this problem. That's less likely to happen if you're using, you know, the hardware interfaces. Okay, so you might say, why are you bringing all this up? Well, I'm bringing that up because um, the next protocol that we look at, I2C, has, has its own solution to that problem that's different from, having, from using these, these tri-state uh, electronic cutoffs here. Um, okay, so uh, what value is transmitted? This is an example, you know, test question I gave last spring. What value is transmitted transmitted on the MISO wire uh, of a non-daisy chain multiple slave SPI bus when the corresponding SS wire is one? Well, if the SS wire is one, that means that that slave is not supposed to be participating in in the in the exchange or the transaction that's going on, and thus um, the value it should be transmitting is high impedance or not connected, meaning that it should be disconnecting itself from that because it, the assumption is that um, you know another slave could be dri actively driving that, or maybe no slaves are driving it if there's no transactions going on at all, but there's no way for a slave in this scenario to know that, so it would have to be careful not to drive that guy. Okay, so that's the last topic for SPI. Uh, and the, exam the quiz only um, covers SPI. So, you know, you guys should be in good shape now to take the quiz. Um, next lecture, we'll talk about uh, I squared C. But before I end, and I know I'm running a little later than I said I would, um, I, I wanted to bring up something that I mentioned uh, a couple lectures ago. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that I wanted to go back and, and, and check into this because I was afraid that what I said might have been wrong. Um, I mentioned that SPI and, 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 and I squared C, which is the next protocol we look at, um, can potentially have low latency uh, because they're in, 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 so they're, they're very they're relatively low bandwidth. The, 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 the amount of data you can transfer across these channels per unit time is relatively slow, is small because uh, the clock rates are much uh, lower than what you would have with, say, like a USB 3 or a PCI Express or a SATA connection, um, um, but or even Ethernet. Uh, but but I, I made this argument that that that, that these these connections can be low latency potentially. So I was kind of curious as to how the latency of these things about SPI in particular would compare to something like uh, PCI Express. And you might say, well, why is PCI Express considered high latency. It's because there's overhead. It, it's got a more complex protocol uh, that you have to work through before you actually get to the meat of a transaction. You know, there's more, uh, there's, there's more signaling that has to be done. So, uh, so just to give you an idea, at 16 megahertz, uh, which is the chip speed that we ran last spring, uh, you have an SPI connection at 16 megahertz, um, which I think was the fastest you could run SPI with those chips. There was different speed options. I think that was the, it was either the fastest or the second fastest. But anyway, that is, uh, if you take the reciprocal of 16 million, uh, you get 62.5 nanoseconds per bit. So if you transfer a 600 byte SPI transaction, for instance, it's going to take, uh, including the header, the header uh, exchange I mentioned that you need when you do a multiple um, transaction or multiple byte transaction. It would take 300 microseconds to do that. Um, so I, I looked up a paper that was published recently where they were looking at latency of PCI Express. And um, if you look at this plot on the left, which I got from the paper, um, a 600, and I just chose 600 bytes as just a, a random sample point. Uh, it takes about 1400 nanoseconds to transfer 16, 600 bytes with PCI Express. Um, this is PCI Express. Um, uh, Gen 3. Um, and so it, it turns out it's only, uh, yeah, it's about 1400 nanoseconds. So you're basically 1400 nanoseconds with PCI versus 300 microseconds with SPI. So um, the SPI is actually lower latency uh, by, by, by two orders of magnitude, you know, 215 times more latency. Uh, but if we were to make the clock speed of SPI the same, 
as the uh, 6.2 gigahertz um, speed that uh, that's running in this case. Uh, this is per lane of a PCI Express. Uh, so if, if 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 SPI were to run at the same speed as as PCI Express Gen 3, um, it would only take 768 nanoseconds, which would actually be faster, which would be lower latency. So just to give so that that kind of gives you an idea of the different types of um, technologies here. Um, PCI is more chatty uh, and has more protocol overhead, uh, but it runs at a very fast clock rate. So it's it's tough to compare, you know, something like PCI and SPI in terms of throughput or even latency. So it turns out I was wrong. I shouldn't have said that um, you can potentially get lower latency because th there's such a difference in the clock rate that that's not even true. Um, PCI is lower latency too, unless you could run a really fast <laughs> um, SPI channel. Uh, so anyway, that's that's uh, all the material for um, SPI. We'll we'll uh, jump into the the uh, last two protocols um, uh, next time, which is I squared C and JTAG. Uh, anyone have any questions about PCI? Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll end the lecture here. Uh, that'll give you a little bit of time to take a look at the quiz. Remember, the quiz is due after lecture, right after lecture on Wednesday. Uh, but I, I recommend that you take a look at it. There's no time limit for taking it, so you you know if you open it and check it out now, you know you you have you know until uh, Wednesday to submit it, and you get two two attempts. Um, let us know if you find any bugs or typos or anything strange on the quiz, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you, everyone.